Hello, everyone. So we've just been hearing about the movie Frozen. Now I'm going to take you on a journey to a frozen land, and I'm going to talk about some of the science of ice and water and frozen things as we go on this journey. And I'm also going to show you some pictures and uh, movies of what it's like to live and work in this, in this frozen land. So where am I talking about? I'm talking about this land down here at the bottom, at the bottom of the planet. Hands up if you know what, where I'm talking about. Yeah. South, Pole. South Pole, yes. And another name for the South Pole is the Antarctic continent, so Antarctica. And Antarctica, which is over the South Pole, it's 10,000 miles away from here, and it's the coldest, the driest, and the windiest place on the Earth. Okay? So lots of reasons to go there if you're a meteorologist like, like I am. So a meteorologist is someone who studies the weather and the climate, and this is an interesting place to go and study those things. And Antarctica is truly a frozen land. So this is a satellite image. This is a picture from space of Antarctica. And you can see it's really white, and that's because it's a frozen land. 90% of all the ice in the world is in Antarctica. And that's mainly glaciers, like you can see in this picture here, which is frozen water. Okay? And then th there's so much frozen water, there's so much frozen snow compacted on, on Antarctica that it actually pushes the land down. So some of the land is below sea level. And then there's this other white stuff around here. That's sea ice. Okay? And in the wintertime, the sea freezes, and it makes Antarctica seem about twice the size than it actually is. So how do we get to this frozen land? What is our journey? Well, what I'm going to do is tell you a little bit about when I went to Antarctica for the first time in 1999, a few years ago. And how did I get there? Well, here's us here in Great Britain, and here's Antarctica down here at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. And it's basically almost the other end of the world. So first of all, to get there, I first of all got on a plane, and I flew from the UK down to these islands here, the Falkland Islands, and then changed out of the plane and onto a ship. And I used, we used this ship to go past these few islands here, past South Georgia, Bird Island, Signe Island, and then traveled all the way to this base here called Halley, which is on a floating ice shelf. So it actually is the base itself, the buildings itself are on a floating ice shelf on the edge of the Antarctic continent. And I did this when I was working for the British Antarctic Survey, so I should just thank uh, my colleagues at the British Antarctic Survey for some of the equipment they, they loaned they loaned us today, and, um, and some of the uh, slides as well, though most of the slides are pictures I took. Okay, so we did this leg on a ship, and this is the ship. This is the Ernest Shackleton, named after the famous explorer, and I spent uh, over a month on this ship traveling down to this frozen land. I'm just going to show you a few pictures of uh, the first place we stopped at, which is South Georgia, which is not Antarctica, but it's getting on the way to a frozen land, it's very mountainous. You can see this, uh, the edge of the, the uh, island here, and this is our ship uh, in the moored. Um, and one of the, <laughs> one, of the, one of the nice reasons to stop in South Georgia is it's a fantastic place for animals and biodiversity. And does anyone know what this is? Hands up. OK, you, you boy here with the... It's a seal. Anyone? Now, this is a tricky question. Anyone know what type of seal? A sea lion. It's not a sea lion. That's a good guess, though. Anyone know what type of seal? Boy in the blue? It's not a common seal. One more guess. The blonde girl here. It, good guess. It is a pup. It is a baby seal, and it's a baby fur seal. You can see it's got quite furry skin here, and that needs that furry skin to keep it warm. Okay, want another picture? Oh. <laughs> Anyone know what type of seals these are? Okay, blonde girl here. No, girl behind you? Or oh, this boy here? No. Good guess, but it's not a gray seal. I tell you what, the, these are the females 
These are the females, and this is the male. And you can, I'll, I'll let you have another guess. <laughs> in the blue. Yes, very good. It is an elephant zoo. You can see it's got this sort of trunk on the front here. And this is the, this is the daddy, and the, the other two were the uh, mummies. Um, and they were all on South Georgia losing their skin. You can see them doing a bit of uh, molting here, so shedding their skin. Lots of other interesting animals on, on our journey south. Penguins. Okay, hands up. Does anyone know what type of penguin? The boy here. Anyone know what type of penguin? Boy in the blue. Good guess. It's not a daily penguins. Boy in the red. No good guess, though. Anyone else? One more guess. The girl here. Rock hopper. Another good guess. These are actually Gen 2 penguins. Um... More penguins. Anyone? The boy here. Anyone? Do you know the type of penguin this is? It, that is a very good guess. It is not an emperor penguin. We might see some emperor penguins later. They look very like emperor penguins, but one down from an emperor. What's one down from an emperor? Is it, a king? it is a king penguin. Very good. Very good. And here's a picture of me with, with some king penguins. You can see that they're, they're looking a little bit sorry for themselves because they're also molting, so they're losing their feathers, and they've got the nice, clean, new-looking feathers underneath. And, and here's a picture of me looking uh, uh, younger. <laughs> but one of the things you'll notice is I'm, I've got a woolly hat on, and I'm, it's quite chilly here. I mean, the sun's shining. It was a nice day, but it's quite chilly here. And when you go... When you travel to a frozen land, it's very important to dress up uh, for the cold weather. And you can see us on, a, on an expedition here. We're in the back of a sledge here. Uh, and we're all dressed up with warm boots on and jackets and hats. Uh, and here's, here's another picture of uh, myself in front of a tent on the Antarctic continent. You can see, look at those boots. Wow, you know, those are, those are going to keep your feet warm. So what we want to do now, if we get the lights up, we're going to ask for some volunteers to dress up in some uh, warm weather clothing. So one from here. How about you? Yes. And uh, one other volunteer. How about you with your spotty top? And we've got some um, clothing on loan from the British Antarctic Survey. And what we're going to do, if you just come behind here a sec, we're now going to switch to a, a different camera and we're going to watch our two young people dress up in this warm weather gear. So if we could switch to the infrared camera, please. Yes. Now, do you want to... So this is this camera here, you can see, at the front, and it's pointing at all these people over here, and you can see their orange and red. You can see Fuchsia there making uh, funny, funny shapes. So what this camera is showing is it's, it's basically showing the temperature that people are. Okay, so we're not looking at visible light, we're looking at the temperature that, that people are. So you can see that uh, the little boy and little girl are nice and warm, and in the background you've got the Christmas tree and the um, curtains, and then they're pretty cold. You can see the Christmas tree is very cold in the base there. So what we're going to do is watch our young people dress up in this warm weather gear and see how their temperatures change. Okay, so let's, let's start getting changed. Okay, let's get this warm weather gear on. You, do you want to get in the trousers? There we go. Okay, so as you can see, as they're getting changed, their temperatures are changing, aren't they? What's happening? Looks like, almost like they're, they're disappearing, right? Look at that. They're going from orange and red and becoming purple. Fantastic. Hat on. Why don't you... That's fantastic. And just step forward and then we can see you in the camera. Does anyone know Harry Potter's invisibility cloak? 
Well, it's true, right? It really works. Fantastic. So they can see they've hardly, hardly moved, uh, hardly visible now. All you can see is their faces. You can see even their sunglasses and goggles are cold, so they're hiding them away, hiding them away. Okay, round of applause for our volunteers. Thank you very much. Okay, if you get... Okay, that's brilliant. So we can use these infrared cameras to measure temperature at night time or in places where there's bad visibility so we can't see what's going on. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks very much. So we could, actually, we can lower the lights here for a few seconds and see what we can see. Um, so imagining it's getting dark. What are we seeing here? You see yourselves? Yay! Okay. Okay, lights back on. Thank you very much. Okay. So a bit of a bit of uh, a bit of fun uh, in looking at body temperatures and, and, and the infrared. So I'm going to continue our journey south now. So this is us leaving South Georgia and getting back on the ship and traveling south towards the frozen land, so we passed Signy Island, and after a while we started to see some frozen, frozen water. So what, hands up, what's this a picture of? Uh, there's a boy here. It is an iceberg, and an iceberg, what's an iceberg? Well, an iceberg is snow that has fallen out of the sky, and it's landed on land, and it's become compacted into a glacier, and then over time, that glacier has moved off the land and broken off. Calling, that process is called calving. And the glacier has calved the iceberg, and then the iceberg has floated away and, uh, and drifted northwards. So an iceberg is frozen water uh, drifting on the sea. Okay. Anyone know what this is a picture of? Hands up. Anyone know what this is a picture of? Little girl here in the grey. Yes, it is when the water freezes and becomes sea ice. So this is different to an iceberg. This is sea ice and this is salty um, because it's come from the surface waters of the ocean getting really cold and freezing. Okay, and here's another picture close up of a more solid sea ice pack and this is frozen ocean, uh, frozen sea ice, uh, frozen water forming sea ice. Now, one thing to notice in both of these pictures is that the frozen water, the ice, is floating. Okay, it doesn't sink. And we're going to do an experiment now to examine that because it's, it brings out the question, why does ice float and why do other substances uh, does the solid not float? So we need a couple of volunteers. Okay, so uh, this boy here and this girl here. Okay. And we're going to do an experiment to show that ice floats and other solids don't float. Okay, so you know what, that you can have um, matter in... in liquid form or solid form or gas form, okay? So water is the liquid form and ice is the, fro is the solid form of water. And what we're going to do is we're going to, we've got our volunteers here and they're going to drop in some ice into this tube of water and then we've also got a tube of another liquid, this time it's olive oil. And we're going to see what happens when some frozen olive oil gets dropped in, in that. But first of all, we're going to start off with some frozen water. It's quite slippy. And we're going to, it's been dyed red just so you can see it. Oh, yeah. 
What happens? Floats, right? Do you want to do another one? Okay. No, no. That was not planned that. Okay. Don't worry. What we'll do now is we'll it's quite slippy as well. This is the this is the olive oil ice cube. We'll pop that in the olive oil and see what happens. Oh, sinks. Try another one. Try it in there. Sinks. Okay. Thanks very much. So, um, a round of applause for our helpers. <laughs> what we've demonstrated is, two, is, a, is, is an illustration of the density of these two substances. Okay? So, the density is basically how packed together all the particles are within a substance. Okay, so another way of thinking about it is it's how heavy that substance is uh, divided by how much space it takes up. Okay, so this picture on the left here is low density and this picture on the right is high density. Okay, and what we saw in our, in our demonstration there was that the density of ice is less than the density of water. Okay, whereas the density of oil is more than the den solid oil is more than the density of uh, liquid oil. So I've got some graphs here, and this is showing density against temperature. Okay, and you can see that the highest density for the water is about here. So it's about four degrees centigrade. Okay, so it's above freezing, and and when water is frozen, it actually has lower density than the water. Whereas if you look at the black line on the right side here, this is oil. And this is, the black line is showing the density here. And the density is increasing the colder it gets. And it increases all the way to zero. Okay, so the higher uh, density, um, in this case for oil, the, the, the solid state um, is the densest. And that's why it sinks down through the liquid state. So water is pretty unusual in this regard. And it's due to what water is made up of. And I'm not going to say any more than that. Okay, but it's, water. it's to do with the way that the molecules attach to each other. Um, so in, uh, in water, they organize themselves in a very clever way, and that leads to these properties, these unusual properties. Okay, I'm going to continue our journey now. And we've reached the edge of the Antarctic continent, and we're going to tie... We've got our, our ship full of equipment and personnel to go and do some science on the Antarctic continent. So we need to tie up and start unloading our goods. So we're going to tie up here at the edge of the sea ice. You can see this iceberg here, massive iceberg in the background. You can see that the iceberg is quite, is quite deep. It's um, a few hundred meters high, whereas the sea ice is only a few uh, meters deep. Okay. And here's the ship. This is the same same location. You can see the ship with the ropes tied up to the sea ice edge. And you can see we're starting to crane some things to unload the ship. So uh, here's a picture of us unloading a snow cat onto the sea ice. But hang on a minute. Is that going to support the weight of a snow cat? The snow cats, this weighs as much as a car. Is sea ice really going to support that? I mean, if we think back to the film Frozen, this is what can happen. If you're running across sea ice, you can get into all sorts of trouble. Here's Kristoff and Sven charging to the, the rescue towards the end of the film, but look, sea ice is all starting to, to break apart, and these ships are moving about. My word. Phew. Good boy. So I think we need to do another experiment. So if we can have uh, four volunteers this time, 
Um, so, and boy in the red jumper, and your friend as well in the red, um, and the girl here with the pigtails, and uh, your friend as well, beside, sitting beside you. So we're going to do the experiment now to try and work out the strength of sea ice and whether sea ice. So if you just come and line up behind uh, one of these trays, okay? You come, you come, yeah. You come this one. You come this one. You stay there. You go. You go to the end one. Okay. Okay, so what we've got here, I just told horses, what we've got here are four sheets of sea ice, uh, sorry, four sheets of ice, um, and we're going to test how strong they are by standing on them. Okay, so we've got four volunteers, and we're going to go through it one by one. We're going to start at this end, uh, and this ice here is five centimetres thick. So we'll just have a quick show of hands. Who thinks five centimetres is strong enough to support our little volunteer here. Ooh, most of you think that. Okay, okay. Well, let's have... Come up? Let's have a test. Whoa, okay. We've, next, we've got a sheet of ice that is three centimetres thick. Who thinks three centimetres is enough to support you? Okay, okay, that's probably most of you again. Ooh. Oh! <laughs> and strong enough to support you standing, but not strong enough to support you jumping. Okay, thank you. Two centimeters. Who thinks two centimeters is going to be strong enough? Hands up. Not many people at all. Okay, do you want to hold, hold his hands? Oh, two centimetres. Last volunteer, one centimetre. Does anyone think one centimetre is going to support? She's a little bit, little bit smaller than um, the, these people, so maybe, maybe. But I, Okay, let's give it a shot. <laughs> Not even one foot. Okay. Thank you very much to our volunteers. You can have a sweet if you like. Okay, so it's looking like a good bet, okay, because as you saw in the earlier pictures, this sea ice is, is, is quite thick. You can see it's uh, a couple of meters thick, and so that is, um, you know, 200 centimeters thick, which should be strong enough to support our, our snow cat as we lower it um, onto the sea ice. And in fact, when we start unloading the ship, we find that it's really quite strong. It's strong enough to tow these sledges here, which can carry up to a ton, ton and a half of goods. So here you can see we're unloading drums of fuel, uh, which are going to power the base and fly the airplanes and, uh, uh, during the winter time. So sea ice is actually pretty strong. But I should just, yeah, health and safety police have just uh, reminded me that uh, we do need to be careful on sea ice, so if you're out playing in the wintertime and you see sea ice on a, you see ice on a pond, um, you need to think very carefully about whether to go on that or not. If it's only a few centimetres thick, you know, you could crack through and fall in, and that's very dangerous. So you do have to be very careful on ice and uh, make sure that it's very thick before you go on it, okay? So we went and tested from the, air, from the ship how thick the sea ice was before we unloaded anything. So when you start unloading the goods onto your frozen land, you need to think about how to transport it about. And in the olden days, this was our, this was our way of traveling about. Um, there's water in. Uh, a sledge pulled by dogs. But in more modern times, there's no dogs in Antarctica now. We've moved to uh, snowmobiles and skidoos pulling lightweight sledges. And then we've got our snowcats. 
uh, pulling heavier sledges. And if we really want to move heavy objects, we've got these caterpillar tractors um, to uh, move things around, move heavy objects around. And um, you know, I think probably some of the moms and dads have experienced a bit of frost in the car in the morning. Uh, <laughs> You know, you listen and breakfast radio is telling you to go out and scrape your car. So this is quite a lot of scraping required before this tractor got going. Um, after unloading all the goods from the ship, we had about 10 kilometers to travel to get about 5 kilometers of sea ice. And then we went up onto the floating ice shelf. So that's a floating glacier where our base is located. And you can see the base here. This is the main building here, another building here, and some more buildings down here, and various other uh, pieces of uh, small buildings and pieces of equipment dotted around. And in the distance, you can see the coastline. Um, and we could fly planes. With, we've got a runway here. Um, we could fly planes uh, from this base. Here's a close-up picture of the base. You can see it looks pretty, pretty space age. Uh, they've got a base now that looks even more space age, but this was the one uh, when I was there. And um, you can see that the base is actually on stilts. Okay? It's about five meters off the ground. And every year, they had to jack it up these legs. Um, why do you think the base is not on the ground? Girl, right at the back, you have to shout. It, possibly the, the, the snow might melt. That's one problem. Any other problems anyone can think of? Boy in the blue. I didn't hear you. Yes, yeah, snowing, snow buildup on the base. If you put something on the ground and it snows, the snow tends to get blown against the building or blown against the object, and then eventually it will get buried. And down here at Halley, at 74, 73 south, snow doesn't melt, okay? It doesn't get above, above zero any time. And so the snow is not going to go away. So if you if you put a building on the ground, it'll just eventually get covered. So here, because we've got some space underneath the building, the snow can get blown underneath, and it doesn't accumulate and, and cover the building. But we also had some of these buildings. This was our summer base. So this is the, this is the building that I stayed in, our summer building. There's 20 of us who slept in there. And this building does get snow that builds up at the side. But we've got a clever way of coping with that. Does anyone have any ideas how we could cope with that? Any ideas? Boy in the blue. The, it does, the metal does warm up, so some of the snow melts, that's true. Any other ideas how we cope with the snow building up? You. Uh, yes, that would work for a little while. Okay. Little blonde boy. Blowers? Say again. Blowers. Blowers. That would be uh, an interesting solution, but I think it would be quite expensive to have blowers. I'll tell you what we do. What we do with the snow build up here is we actually move the building. <laughs> so the building is on skis, and we get one of those big tractors, and we tow the building away for 50 50 meters, and then we get a bulldozer in and flatten the snow, and then we can tow it back again. And this is, this is what happens to all the fuel that gets stored for the winter. Now, that's a little bit about living in Antarctica. What was I doing there? I mentioned earlier that Antarctica is the windiest, coldest, and driest place uh, in the world. And... Um, I was there studying the weather and the climate, and uh, one of the ways we do that is by putting out weather stations. So this is a, a, a weather station that we set out a few hundred kilometers away from the base on the Antarctic continent. So it was a few hundred kilometers away, so we had to get there by, by plane. And you can see we flew this small twin otter aircraft. And if you look at its wheels, it's got some skis attached to the wheels, so it's able to land on the snow. Um, so we had this weather station out here for the previous year, and we turned up, and this is us downloading the data from the weather station onto this computer here. Uh, you can see it's got a vane, a weather vane on the top, and this is measuring the wind direction, and the propellers are measuring the wind speed, and then inside these two white 
uh, uh, containers here, these screens here, we're measuring temperature and humidity, and we measure pressure as well. We download all that information onto computers, and it helps tell us about the weather and climate of Antarctica. And this is another piece of equipment we use. Sometimes you can see they've got this, it looks like a, an egg, egg carton. Uh, this, is a, this is called a wind profiler, and it uses sound waves beamed up into the atmosphere to measure the profile of wind. And what we're trying to find out about is the winds that dominate the Antarctic climate, um, which come off the continent, and they're very cold and very strong. Uh, and they contribute to Antarctica being the windiest place in the world. Now, it wasn't all work. We had a bit more. We had some fun from time to time. And uh, this is us visiting a penguin colony. Hands up if you can guess what type of penguins these are. With a go with a hat on. Antarctic penguins, yes. Anyone got another name for them? Boy in the blue, uh, grey. Emperor penguins. They are emperor penguins. And there's one adult here, and lots and lots of babies uh, in the grey. You can see they're pretty big, actually, already. They're pretty big. This is, they've been born a wee while ago. Um, there's me looking uh, nice and warm, all dressed up in my warm weather gear. And this is one of my favorite photos. You can see we've we're, uh, got some emperor penguins on the sea ice, and in the background we've got the edge of the Antarctic continent. So this is a glacier which is maybe 50 or 100 meters higher than, than where we are. So visiting the penguins was one fun activity. Another fun activity we did, maybe we could have the lights down a little bit, please? Okay. And, uh, oh, that, there we go. Um, and what you can see what we're doing here is we're abseiling uh, down into this crevasse. So crevasse is basically a hole in the glacier. And as we went into this hole, you can see it was like entering a magical kingdom. This is like, you know, I was, I was almost bump, expecting to bump into Elsa down here. It was, it's incredible colors of blues and purples and indigos. And you can see that these icicles coming down from the edge of the, the walls here. Um, and on these icicles, there was frost building up. Okay, so there was uh, water freezing onto the icicles and forming frost. And what we're going to do now is we're going to... What we're going to do now, and, and, and the same thing happens on, for people. So if you're out and it's very cold and, and moist, you can get uh, frost forming on your hair or on your clothes, uh, on the eyelashes of uh, my colleague here, former colleague here, and on her eyebrows. It doesn't hurt, but it is quite, makes you feel quite cold. What we're going to do now is try and do some freezing here on stage. So if we have the lights up again, thanks. And uh, we'll have a couple of volunteers, shall we? Yes, yeah, so we'll have a couple of volunteers. But this is fraught with danger volunteering here. <laughs> okay, the girl in the purple. Um, and um, the boy with the glasses and the red jumper. And one more volunteer, the girl with the black and the headband. Now, we've set this experiment up. So this, this is an, it's very difficult to do freezing in the theater. Why is that? Because it's quite warm in here, okay? It's like 20 degrees. And so trying to make frozen icicles like Elsa does in Let It Go is, is a bit tricky uh, because it's too warm, okay? So what we're going to do instead is we're going to try and freeze water. And we've been running a little experiment in the background here. And in this experiment, we've got beakers um, which have got an, a salty ice bath in. So we've got ice in here and salt, and that should have lowered the temperature uh, to below zero. And inside uh, each of the three beakers, we've put a little plastic box, a tic-tac box, actually, with very pure water in, and we've got thermometer in, um, in those tic-tac boxes. And we're going to have a look at these thermometers. So who can read a thermometer? Okay, we're looking at who can you, you can read the red line, can't you? Ah, you can see this one here. Can you see the zero there? and the minus 5 and the 5. So what do you think the temperature is? About minus 2. 
minus 2. Okay, so that's below 0. Um, what about this one here? Can you see this one here? Minus 1. Minus 1. And that is also below 0. That's about minus 3. We're going to lift these out. Now, sometimes the water is actually not frozen yet. Sometimes it's become super cooled, so it's below zero. And as you lift it out and uh, wiggle the thermometer, it can instantly freeze. So we'll try and, I'll, I'll try and do this with this one here um, and, and show it to the camera because I know it's quite small. So we're going to lift that out and you can see it's, it's a little bit frozen um, at the bottom and it's still liquid at the top. You, well, maybe you can't see it that well. Um, shall I try it on the visualizer? I'm not sure if this will this will work. Uh, can we switch the visualizer, please? Oh yeah. Okay. Um, okay. You can see it's frozen at the bottom and still a bit liquid at the top. Let's try the other one. Sometimes they instantaneously freeze as you pull them out, which is really quite cool. Uh, okay. Let's try this one. Oh, that's very frozen, actually. Okay, but not particularly exciting. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you can see it's frozen. Uh, let's try the third one. Is it still liquid? Mm, quite liquid. Okay, pull it out. Yeah, it's very frozen actually as well. Okay. Well, in each of these examples, they've kind of frozen... Uh, before we pulled them out. So you can see that they're basically uh, blocks of ice and they're about uh, a little bit below freezing. But interestingly, the temperatures can go below freezing. So when we first read the temperatures, they were about minus two. So, even, so it's not the case that ice, um, uh, that the water has to, has to uh, stay at zero. It can become below zero. And the reason for that is it becomes super cooled and there's not enough particles to cause freezing within the, within the box itself, within the Tic Tac box. Okay, thanks very much to our volunteers. Um, okay, I'm just going to show you a movie um, of some freezing in the atmosphere now. And um, we've got this uh, very cheery uh, Russian chap who is, lives somewhere very, very cold. And he's just going to show you what happens when uh, you have a very cold atmosphere and you throw hot water in the, in the cold atmosphere. I have to say, uh, don't try this at home unless you're an adult and do it carefully. Um, okay, we'll just watch. Hi, guys. This is Snowsibirsk and this is about minus 41. So we want to see what happens to just boiled water outside. Here we go, boiled water. Instant ice. Very good. Now, here at the University of East Anglia, uh, I work in the School of Environmental Sciences, and we study uh, everything in the earth and environment. And um, one of the things that we've built recently is a sea ice chamber. And this is, uh, this is just over uh, in the science block, one of the science blocks over there. And I've got a sketch of, of what it looks like and some photos here. So this is a photo of the sea ice chamber empty. And this is with it full of water. And what we do is we can put a, uh, an, a box on the top of here and we can create a sealed atmosphere. And then we can do amazing atmosphere and ocean uh, ice experiments. So we can form sea ice in the chamber and we can measure uh, the physical and chemical properties of the water and the physical and chemical properties of the atmosphere. 
and we can control the temperature of both by a mixture of heating and cooling elements and fans and things like that in here. And it's in, all inside a room which is like a giant freezer. You, you need to be dressed up warm to go inside there. And um, this is a fantastic new facility that uh, we've had built at the university and we're just starting to do some really nice experiments doing things like freezing water and forming sea ice and looking at the chemistry and physics that is going on during that process. So I'm just going to show you a little movie. So thanks to James for providing this, James France for providing this. And what you're looking at here, it's black and white, but you're, you're in this same sea ice chamber here, okay? But the camera is in the bottom of the water and it's looking up. And I'm just going to show you um, a little clip of sea ice forming, okay? So the, the water's being cooled down and the sea ice starts to form, and it starts to form on the lid of the water, okay, which is what happens in reality, and that's because it needs something for the ice to form onto, and, it, and it's speeded up, and now it's starting to melt, okay, so it was very quickly frozen there, you, you can look at the clock in the corner, and it very froze over an hour or so, and then this is a few hours later, and we've stopped cooling it down, and it gradually, uh, gradually melts. Do you want that again? Was that very quick? Yes? Okay. I'll just quickly show it again, because uh, I think I'm not too behind schedule. But I'll just show it again. So you can see the ice all sort of conglomerating together, and it, it starts to freeze on. You can see it freezes on to other bits of ice, and that's because it needs these condensation nuclei. And then we flip forward in time, and it starts to, starts to melt um, as we've switched the heating off. Switch the cooling off, sorry. It all starts to break up. And, uh, and disappear. So we're looking forward to doing lots of cool experiments, literally, in the sea ice chamber. We can measure all sorts of properties with this tower of sensors here to measure temperature and salinity and chemical properties of the water and the sea ice. Um, you get really amazing things forming as well. This is called a frost flower. Okay, and these form naturally in, in, in the real world and they, they, they build on the crystalline structures of water and ice to form these very pretty flower-like formations. And, we, and they actually managed to get, get one of these built, uh, forming in the, in the lab a few weeks ago. So I'm coming to the end of our journey to a frozen land. Um, here's a nice picture of us uh, going down to play on the sea ice. You can see uh, the photos taken from glaciers from the Antarctic continent. And then there's the drop down, and this is sea ice here, um, and an iceberg in the, in the distance. What have we learned in our journey to a frozen land? We've learned that ice is frozen water. So ice is the solid, and water is the liquid. Ice is frozen water. Ice floats because it's less dense than water, so the particles are further apart in the ice than they are in the water. And that's unusual because in the oil and most other substances, when you go to the solid, the particles are closer together and so they're less, they're denser and, and so they sink. But water's unusual. We've learned that thick ice is strong enough to support snow cats or tractors or sledges full of fuel. But thin ice can break under your own weight. So remember here, two centimeters and it broke one centimetre and it broke, three centimetres and jumping up and down and it broke. So you've got to be careful. We've learned that water in the air freezes into ice particles. So if you're Elsa, you can create your own ice out of thin air. Or if you're living in Russia and it's minus 41, you can throw hot water out of your tower block and uh, create instant ice. And liquid water also freezes into ice and can form frost flowers. So with that, I'd say thanks very much, and that's the end. Thank you.